Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Sacramento Home Buyer Workshop. My name is Jason Maida. Thanks for joining us for uh, tonight's class. Really excited to have everybody with us. Um, we get a chance to teach these classes about every other week in different markets across the country. So really excited to be with you this evening, right in our, our own backyard of Sacramento. So um, tonight's session, um, in case you haven't kind of heard about our sessions, we try to make them very interactive for you. So we encourage questions as we roll through tonight's content. Uh, tonight's <coughs> presentation is really designed for first time home buyers. So tonight you're gonna to learn a little bit about assistance programs as well as the process of buying a house. And we'll talk a little bit more about talking points in just a second. Just quick, a little bit about me. I'm um, the branch manager here of American Pacific Mortgage. We're based out of downtown Sacramento um, and uh, we service California, Arizona and some of the Virginia markets uh, right from our office here. But we are a nationwide company that services our local communities and home ownership. So a little bit about tonight's discussion point. So we're gonna look at the housing market. Lots of great things to talk a little bit about in the housing market um, and maybe some kind of changes are kind of taking shape in the housing market. We're gonna look at a buy versus rent analysis in just a minute or so. Um, we're gonna spend some time looking at credit and how credit can impact you from a qualifying perspective. Uh, we'll also look at different stu uh, student loans and how student loans get counted into what we call as the debt to income ratio and how that maybe can uh, change your qualifying for your mortgage. We'll look at different loan programs, uh, minimum credit scores for those programs, as well as the features and benefits of them look at some of the qualifying income. We'll talk a lot about down payment assistance programs. Many of you might be even joining tonight's class because you've heard about some of the Cal HFA programs. So we'll spend some time reviewing that as well. And then we'll wrap up tonight's discussion, looking at the six steps of home buying and some kind of um, familiar home buying terms that you should know as you're entering the market. And then I'll talk to you really briefly about a personal consultation and what a pre-approval looks like for you. Okay, um, again, tonight we encourage you to ask questions. Um, I'll be answering questions through the chat function or through Q&A uh, in Zoom. So feel free to reach out to us any questions. Um, if it's on topic or off topic, we'll still try to incorporate those into tonight's discussion. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about home buying and you know what that means for us and the benefits that come along with it. Um, when we think about home buying, it's probably gonna be the biggest investment we make in our lifetime. So the fact that, you know, all of you that are joining tonight's class are taking the time out to kind of do your homework and figure out what home buying looks like is, is super important. And we're glad you guys can do that because when we think about home buying, there's some benefits that come with it, including stability of your housing budget. So we can create more of a fixed budget. So we're not worrying about maybe a landlord increasing our rent costs. Um, this is an asset. So we can pass along that asset to maybe the heirs of our estate. Um, equity is created through um, the, the grow, uh, growth of value of our home. So when we look at what we buy the house for, as the home appreciates the difference between what we owe on a house versus what the market value is, that creates home equity. And that's obviously a, a source of wealth for us. And there still is some tax benefits that come along with home buying. So a lot of great benefits that come along with owning a home. It, it's not going to be something we're going to want to compare maybe apples to apples when we look at our rent versus rent budget versus a home buying budget. And so taking the time out to look at the rent versus buying calculators, I think is a great place to kind of launch us into tonight's discussion. So um, this tool is brought to us by Freddie Mac. And uh, what it allows us to do is do a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison on what it could look like to uh, continue to rent and go down that path, or if we decide to buy what it could look like for us in home ownership. So uh, by the way, it's kind of a side note, all of the, um, the presentation material we share with you tonight, all these resources, the different links that we share with you tonight, they're all gonna be sent out to you tomorrow morning. So you have that all for your reference. I'd encourage you to try to take notes as we go through tonight's um, material, but um, you'll have this, you have the presentation items uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so let's say we assume, and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of fill in some of these, these data points here in the, in the calculator. Let's say we have a $2,500 rent. We're just gonna plug that in for now. Uh, we're also gonna assume a monthly renter's insurance of $15. And then we're also gonna assume that the rent that we're paying currently is gonna go up 3% per year. So every time we renew our, our lease, that it would go up by 3% per year. Now, when we look at the home purchase, I know it'll vary, vary, uh, vary for all of us here in, in tonight's discussion. So we may be looking at a $300,000 house, maybe an $800,000 house. Let's just say five fifty dollars for right now. I know um, that will vary for many of us. But if we looked at a five fifty dollars purchase price, assuming a minimum down payment of 3%, which is somewhere in the you know, $16,500 range, uh, we also would want to factor in our property taxes. Generally, property taxes are going to be 1.25% or maybe less, maybe more of your, of your purchase price. 
as a baseline in qualifying you for your mortgage, we always take 1.25% as a property tax rate. Uh, we want to factor in homeowners insurance. Um, and then we're going to put our, our budget for maintenance. Um, and so that can also vary by the, maybe the type of property you buy. If you buy a condo versus a single family home, or maybe if you're buying a, a, maybe an older home versus a brand new house, that maintenance budget will kind of fluc uh, fluctuate a little bit. And then, then in, from a loan information perspective, we want to plug in, generally it's going to be a 30 year fixed mortgage. We're going to learn about different terms of mortgages tonight. But we'll, generally, for most of our first-time buyers, we're going to be looking at a 30-year fixed mortgage. Uh, interest rates, that's a topic of conversation again for tonight as well. But we're going to plug in 5.875 for right now. That's, that's kind of slipped down just a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about what may change that over the course of this week. But we'll put 5.875 for now. Origination charges are going to be what a lender is going to charge you for your financing. Uh, our usual costs are $910 for our processing fee and $995 for our underwriting fee. Uh, you're going to learn about some of our discount partnerships that we have across uh, across the market with different uh, alumni partnerships, as well as with state of employee, uh, state of California employees. So that's a way that you can get discounted services. But the baseline origination charge is about $1905. And then this discount points line it gives you the ability as a consumer to buy down your interest rate and it's called points. Effectively, what you're doing is you're paying a cost or an expense in your loan to help reduce the interest rate offering that you receive. So generally one point will equal 1% of your loan amount and that 1% can potentially bring down your rate 0.25%. Okay, so those are called discount points. And then other settlement charges are gonna be things like title and escrow fees maybe some transfer taxes, whatever the case may be. What I would recommend budgeting when it comes to what we call closing costs is about two to 3% of your purchase price. That's generally what we see as a pretty good estimate. If, um, if you're one of our um, audience members joining us from the Bay Area, some counties in the Bay Area might be a little more expensive from a closing cost perspective based upon you know maybe the county that you're purchasing in or the agreements with sellers. But as kind of a rule of thumb, we always estimate at like two to 3%. Okay. Uh, now we're also going to make the assumptions of appreciation rates. We're going to say 3%. Uh, so basically our home could potentially go up 3% per year. We don't obviously want to build our plan off of that, but we got to assume our home will grow in appreciation. For those of our existing homeowners that we've helped out over the last few years, um, you know, certainly the last two or three years, clients have seen a lot of appreciation, but we want, don't want to bet on that when it comes to buying a home. Uh, expected years in the house, we'll say seven years. The selling costs, we're gonna factor in 10 years. And these inputs that we're putting in is, is saying that at the end of seven years, this is what the expenses are gonna look like that we'll have to pay. Now, it's important to note that as a buyer, you're not responsible for paying for the realtor commissions uh, when a buyer represents you. Those are paid for by the seller as part of the sale of their home. Now, when you turn around and sell your house, potentially, let's say seven years down the road, you'll be responsible for those same costs. And then finally, state and federal taxes, we're going to plug in 33.8 and a savings rate of 1%. So what our calculator does, it takes our total payments. So we're paying right now, we know 2,500 in rent. Our mortgage payment is going to go up to about $4,400 if we put 3% down. Now, that's obviously a, a big jump up. But our opportunity um, over seven years is about $39,000 um, by buying versus renting, even in a higher rate environment. And how we come up with that is based upon potential tax deductions and then the appreciation in our home over the seven years and having that fixed monthly expense versus having the variable expense in growing rent costs. So um, now, again, everybody's situation is a little bit different. So I'd encourage you to maybe take a peek at this calculator when you have a free moment and, and do your own um, kind of side-by-side -side comparison yourself. But certainly that can help you give a good launch pad into looking at home buying a little bit closer for you. Okay, so that's our rent versus buying calculator. Now let's, let's get back into our slideshow. Uh, and I want to kind of... Uh, transition a little bit now, talk a little about the housing market. Um, the housing market's changing as we speak. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of comment on the last two to three years and then give you guys a, some, some uh, perspective on what we're seeing uh, here currently. In fact, we're going to, I think we're going to post a video tonight or to this week, I should say, on the housing market and our social media channel. So you can kind of hear more about this later on. But Ultimately, you know, we are seeing some softening in the market right now, um, and interest rates are driving a lot of that in the buyer behaviors. Um, now, let's kind of table that for a second. If we look back to this kind of line here, which is 
to 2020 or the start of the pandemic, um, we see massive, you know, raise in, in price of homes driven by limited inventory, huge buyer demand, buyers now having remote work environments. So that changes, you know, their, the, the, the need to be in more densely populated areas. Uh, and then, of course, historically, uh, um, lowest rates we've seen historically, you know, rates reaching into the twos at some point. So all of that kind of fueled our housing market here. And that's why we see this massive appreciation across all markets, really across the country, California specifically in our, you know, Sacramento Bay Area, Central Valley, Southern California markets all saw really strong appreciation. And that has been moving at about the same pace until we get to first quarter of this year. And now we're starting to see a little bit of this right here, see a little bit of a crest in the housing appreciation. And now I think if we were to push this, this graph out a little bit, we're probably seeing a little bit of a flattening. And where we're currently at from a market perspective, at least what I see in the front lines is uh, inventory is starting to sit a little bit longer. So we're now we're starting to see sellers are not getting top dollar and now we're seeing price reductions. Many of you that maybe hop on Zillow or whatever, probably seen some homes that you're maybe monitoring, starting to see some price reductions. Um, and so that I think bodes very well for our first time home buyers. And then on top of that, interest rates rising pretty significantly over the last six, uh, sorry, last two months uh, to an average rate of about 5.875 is changing buyer behavior. So some of our move up buyers are not maybe moving up as much now. So maybe they're kind of pulling back a bit. So maybe not as many buyers out in the pool. Um, and now our first time buyers are kind of getting to re-engage with the market. And, you know, I, you know, at least in, in being on the front lines, working with uh, buyers on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we're seeing a lot more success with buyers being able to get accepted offers in the market. It's really encouraging sign. Now, the market doesn't look like, from an interest rate perspective, like it um, like it did in 2020, but I think there still poses some great opportunities for clients. Um, and I was just talking to a first-time home buyer before tonight's class, and you know, you know, her question was, "Well, do you think I'm buying at the right time?" And I think. You know, everybody's situation is a little bit different financially, but I think we all got to keep in mind that real estate cycles, like everything, interest rate cycles, real estate cycles, and we will go through these ups and downs in the market. I think if you're trying to buy into the market and try to make a you know tr quick turnaround in massive equity, that's probably not the right move. If you're trying to create affordable and sustainable home ownership and you're buying within a reasonable price level, then I think it's, it's an awesome opportunity to enter the market. And interest rates are gonna play in role, a role in that in, in getting into the market. And so I think that's where we gotta do some assessment too when it comes to budgeting. Um, this uh, graph over to the right kind of shows you what we've seen over the last five years in interest rates. And you know, it kind of validates what we had just talked about. You know, when you look back at 2020 um, and this kind of right about here is where we saw the pan the start of the pandemic and we saw interest rates really start to go down and, we, and they drove down even further. We saw the interest rate lows here at about 2.5, 2.6% uh, right in the first quarter of 21. Uh, we saw a little bit of a blip in uh, February of 21 where they started to rise, kind of quickly went to like to almost the 3.75, which is a, kind of a little bit of a shock for us. But then interest rates kind of kind of went up and down. And then this these last two months, we've really seen interest rates skyrocket, um, moving from you know 3.75, 4% all the way as 5.8%. So now that kind of leads us up to where we're at now, which we're starting to see rates maybe level out. Um, you know, the market still remains to be seen what happens. Um, the Federal Reserve um, is going to be releasing their monetary policy, um, and we'll get some updates on inflation and what's going on with the market. And we'll see if the, um, the Federal Reserve raises rates again. Uh, some of the raising of rates that we're seeing right now is already kind of baked into what we're, we're experiencing from a mortgage interest rate perspective. So we'll see what, what the announcement comes out tomorrow. A lot of the guidance we're getting right now is to see to float interest rates for some of our clients that are in uh, looking at homes right now um, for potentially maybe a lower rate environment. Uh, but it will remain to be seen what happens from an inflationary perspective if we're kind of on the edge of, of a recession. So we'll have to kind of see how things kind of play out. Um, and we'll certainly be keeping clients updated on what we see in the market. Um, now, interest rates have different characteristics. So not all interest rates are the same. Um, eligibility for the lowest available interest rates will vary by credit, the loan product that you select, um, how much you decide to finance, 
uh, how much you put down. And then we talked about it earlier, but the cost of achieving a lower interest rate. So you can buy discount points if you so choose to, to help lower that interest rate. Uh, and if you also decide to select maybe a lower term rate. So if you decide to go from a 30 year fixed loan to maybe a 15 year fixed product, that will at times lower your rate up to a half a percent. Now, if you're going to elect first-time buyer programs, there only is a 30-year fixed option with first-time buyer programs. 30-year uh, fixed is going to obviously give you the most purchasing power because it's going to achieve the lowest level of payment. But if you're looking at 15-year loan, 20-year, 25, those can all be done through conventional, uh, conventional or, or FHA loans, um, but um, it wouldn't apply for an assistance program. Okay, so that's kind of how we get to interest rates. Now, the, one of the biggest um, components to achieving that lowest interest rate and the best available financing is, is gonna be around credit. So we always like to, during our workshops, to spend some time looking at credit and all of our clients are at different levels of credit, um, you know, and different experiences with credit. Uh, many of you probably have monitoring tools that you use to keep track of where you're at from a credit score perspective. Uh, and those are all great. And I think, but I think it's important as you're preparing for home buying to kind of understand from a lender's perspective, what things might look like. Um, over to the right here represents the FICO score weighting or score calculation. 15% is going to be how long we've had credit. So the longer or more mature our credit file is, the better our credit score could be. 20% is going to be how much credit I have in use. More importantly, that's going to be new accounts that I've just opened or I'm trying to obtain through credit inquiries. There is two different types of credit inquiries. There's a hard inquiry and a soft inquiry. Now, when we start our process, and if you decide to move forward with a pre-approval with us, we start with a soft inquiry. So that won't impact your credit score. Eventually, we'll need to do a hard inquiry, but simply for pre-approval, it starts with a soft inquiry. Um, and then, you know, we kind of move forward from there. Now, a hard inquiry can make an impression on your credit report. Um, and there is rules in place that protect you as the consumer allow you to do some shopping for both mortgage and auto loans. So if you decide to, let's say, apply for an auto loan, you have a 30-day window of time to shop with as many auto finance lenders as you want um, to be able to kind of see what your different options look like. And that's the equivalent of one credit inquiry hit to your score. Same thing holds true for mortgage. So if you do have a mortgage lender that does a hard inquiry to start their process, you have a 30-day window of time to make that, um, to, to shop for those different options, okay? So that's 20% with the in use and new credit. 30% is gonna be how long, or sorry, how, uh, how much credit I have active in the revolving space, also known as credit utilization. This is probably one of the biggest areas of opportunity for most of our clients, uh, because it represents how much I have in credit balances versus what I have in credit limits. So if I have $10,000 in credit limits and a $5,000 balances, that means I'm at 50% utilization. If we're you know, running a little bit higher, 60, 70% utilization, we really wanna to work towards moving that utilization below 50%. If we feel like we've gotten you know, a pretty good level of success there, then we wanna start trying to push that utilization below 10%. And that's gonna to help to optimize our credit score. Now there's a and kind of an important, you know, I guess, coaching opportunity here for you with utilization. When uh, you look at your credit card statements, there's a billing cycle date. That end date for the billing cycle is when the credit card issuer sends out your balance information to the credit reporting agencies. So what I always recommend uh, is kind of a helpful tip is try to pay off or pay down your credit balances before the end of your billing cycle date, because then you're gonna get the best um, possible balance showing on your credit report and hopefully be able to raise your credit score. So if you look at that credit card statement, you'll have a cycle date, let's say of the 20th, and then you have a due date of the 4th. So try and pay that or pay down that card before the 20th, so maybe the 19th. Um, and that's a better way of managing your credit cards to help try to optimize your level of utilization and ultimately your credit score. Finally, 35% is going to be how I paid my bills, so my payment history. If you have any past delinquencies, they're rated as 30-day lates, 60-day, 90-plus delinquencies. So um, when you've had lates in the last 12 to 24 months, those are going to be the most impactful to your credit score. So we really want to try to obviously make on-time payments. Um, if you've had like legacy issues six, seven years out, those aren't going to be as impactful to your score, but certainly things in the last 12 to 24 months 
can uh, can hurt the score a little bit more. Um, there is minimum credit scores with each loan. There's a 580 minimum for FHA. Conventional loans are 620. So that's when we hear Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That's a conventional loan. Uh, VA loans for our veterans that have served is a minimum of 620. And then the Cal HFA first time home buyer assistance has a minimum score of 680, uh, sorry, 640 for FHA loans, uh, 680 for conventional loans. A couple of things I just want to point out to you when it comes to credit. Um, and um, we, we look at specifically with revolving accounts, there's a thing called account closure for revolving accounts. And that basically says that when I no longer need that account, um, I'm going to close out the availability I have. We want to be careful doing that because there's two things that happen when you close out an account. One is you close out an account so it zeroes out the activity of that account. And if you've had a long-standing credit card from 2018, for example, that you zero out and close out that credit card, it pulls all the great history out of your um, out of your score. So you get impacted in the 15% length of credit. Second thing that happens is you also take another line of credit out of your utilization. So your aggregate of your utilization could potentially be impacted, therefore hurting your 30% amount owed. So just be careful closing out accounts. If you do, if you're in the habit of doing balance transfers, that could be something that you know hurts you on that from a credit score perspective. Um, now, in qualifying for financing, we always look at the middle credit score for all clients. So there's three agencies that report: TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. We're going to take the middle of the three. So here's what that looks like. So if I have a 740 is my top score, 720 is my middle, 700 is my lowest score we'll take the 720 score from a qualifying perspective. Now, if my spouse is gonna join me in the financing and they're at 700, 680, and 660, then the lowest middle scores, it would be 680. So in that case, we would use my spouse's uh, credit score for qualifying purposes, okay? So that's what that looks like um, when we look at look at financing. That, that's applicable for all lines of, of programs. Um, now we mentioned a little bit about how long things are going to stay with you or the most uh, the, the impact of like maybe late payments and whatnot. This is kind of the long-term effect of how negative items will remain on your credit. So um, credit inquiries are going to be on your credit report for two years or less. Uh, late payments, collections, judgments, as you can see here, seven years or less. Now, one footnote here, as of this month, I believe medical collections will no, no longer be reporting on your credit report. So if you've had some challenges with medical collections, those should not be on your credit report. And then off to the right, uh, bankruptcies, uh, state tax liens will be all on your credit report for 10 years or less. And then federal debt, like a tax lien or a student loan collection will be on your credit report indefinitely. Um, Side note with federal student debt, or sorry, federal debt in general, you wanna be really careful with that, especially with student loans. If you've gone into collection status, high probability you reported to federal delinquent debt through it. Um, it's, it's, it's an archived uh, registry, but basically it's called the CAVERS report. So as lenders, we have to cross check that uh, when you're applying for financing. If you do have delinquent student loan debt, it could pop up in there and prevent your financing from going through. So really encourage you to make sure you kind of uh, tackle that debt if necessary. Uh, speaking of student loans, uh, there's a calculation that we use as lenders to figure out eligibility. Um, and if you're on a student loan, it's a federal student loan, then you're probably in um, a forbearance right now. Even though you're in forbearance, we still have to count a minimum payment against you for qualifying. Uh, so there's two different kind of approaches. For an FHA loan, we utilize 0.5% of the balance, and then we factor that 0.5% payment into your qualifying. If it's a conventional loan, it's 1% um, of the outstanding balance that counts as a payment. However, if you're on an income-based repayment amount and that's what you were on prior to the start of the pandemic, that's the monthly payment that we'll use um, for qualifying purposes. Now, if you graduated recently, maybe you're a post-pandemic um, post graduate and you haven't started the repayment process yet because you've been in you know, uh, forbearance with uh, federal student debt, then you would have to contact your servicer to see what the income-based repayment is uh, for qualifying purposes. Um, if you are back in school and you're on a deferment, we still have to count a minimum payment against you for qualifying. So basically rule of thumb is if any student loan debt appears on your credit report as a lender, we're gonna have to look to count that against you uh, from a qualifying perspective. Okay, any questions on what we have so far? I want to give a timeout for questions if we have any. Okay. 
Okay, so I can always go back and, and kind of talk through some stuff. If you guys do have some questions that kind of come up, but let's go ahead and roll over to um, loan programs and talk a little more specifically about the characteristics of some of these five core loan programs. So there's conventional loans, FHA, the VA loans for our veterans, USDA loans. That's going to be more for our rural areas, foothill areas, um, you know, some of our North County areas, and then jumbo loans. Uh, jumbo loans aren't going to be um, as common for our first time home buyers. Um, but but for jumbo loans, they do require a minimum down payment of 10 to 15 percent. Um, and that's for clients in the greater Sacramento area that are buying over 675050. Now, uh, there's a characteristic with jumbo loans that we want to just be mindful of. One is the credit score generally minimum is 680 and they also require reserves. What reserves mean is this the amount of money that I have saved for my down payment and closing costs? Um, in addition, I would need a multiplication of a certain number of monthly payments on my mortgage. So let's say, for example, I have a mortgage payment of $5,000 on a jumbo loan. The requirement could be 12 times the amount of payments I have in assets after I've contributed my down payment and closing costs. So in this example, it'd be like $60,000, which would be like in a 401k or retirement or cash, whatever the case may be. Um, so not very common for our first time home buyers to go down that path, but it is a product that's available to you. Um, it does not complement with any of the assistance programs. So you would need to obviously be able to save those amount of assets. Okay, so that's jumbo loans. I want to spend most of our time, though, talking a little bit about conventional and FHA loans, because for about 95% of our first time buyers, that's usually one of those paths that we go down. Uh, conventional loans have a minimum down payment of 3%, where FHA has a minimum of 3.5%. Both loan amounts can go up to um, 675050 in this market. Um, anytime you go beyond 647,000, um, you're going to be into what we call the high balance space. Um, and it can elevate that minimum down payment from 3% to 5%. Okay. So that's called a high balance loan. That's on a conventional loan. FHA still has the flat three and a half percent down payment from zero to 675050. Now these are all county specific. So the, the things that we're teaching on tonight are Sacramento County related. Um, if you're looking in the Bay Area markets, those are different county limits. So obviously can be a much higher because the cost of living, or if you're joining us maybe from Orange County, um, where it's a 970,200 versus a 675 we have here up in, in this market. Um, so the, the difference in, in program uh, credit score minimums too look, look like this. So as we learned earlier, conventional loans are a minimum 620 score. Uh, FHA loans are going to be a minimum score of 580. Now, one of the, the key differences when we look at conventional loans versus FHA loans is around PMI. PMI comes into play when we put less than 20% down. So I want to spend some time looking at conventional loans and that approach to MI, and then we'll take a look at FHA and kind of how they differ. Um, conventional loans uh, require that, that MI with less than 20% down it. Now it's based upon um, a few different factors. Uh, it's based upon, or how it's calculated is based upon your credit score, your down payment, and how much you finance. And there's various ways that you can pay back that MI. It can be done monthly. Uh, it can be done split MI, which is you're paying some monthly, you pay some of it up front. You can uh, buy out the MI completely. It's called a single premium, but that would incur a higher closing cost. Uh, or you can take a higher interest rate, which is called lender paid MI, and that completely buys out the mortgage insurance. Um, most of our clients, I would say probably 90 plus percent are going to elect the monthly MI because it has a feature that allows you to potentially cancel the mortgage insurance when you have two years in the home and 22% equity, you can apply to your servicer for cancellation. And obviously when you cancel, that lowers that mortgage insurance slightly or mortgage, the overall mortgage payment by the reduction of the mortgage insurance. So I, we have an example down here at the bottom of the screen that shows you what PMI looks like on a conventional loan. Um, so let's say we finance 450 uh, and our credit score was 740 and we decided to put the minimum first time buyer 3% down payment the PMI is gonna be about $183 per month, okay? So it's pretty reasonable relative to probably what you, most of you are seeing with online calculators that you'll find like on Zillow or Redfin. So um, the, the key factor is, you know, what's my credit score? How much am I gonna finance? And then what am I gonna put down? Most calculators online are gonna do kind of a carte blanche, lower credit score uh, and not have it um, uh, calibrated for those three kind of characteristics.
So that's conventional mortgage insurance. And then FHA mortgage insurance looks a lot different. There's a standard 0.85% of your loan amount calculation. So we take your loan amount times 0.85%. Divide that by 12. That's how much we come up with. That's how we come up with your mortgage insurance, regardless of credit score. So whether I'm a 640 score or a 740 score, I'm still going to pay the same premium of mortgage insurance. Now, that's for a minimum down payment of three and a half percent. If I decide to put more down, which doesn't usually happen on FHA, but if I do and I put at least 10 percent down, then that monthly MI factor drops to 0 0.80 percent. Now, there's two components to mortgage insurance for FHA. There's monthly mortgage insurance and there's upfront mortgage insurance. The monthly is how I just described without calculation. Now there's also upfront, which is 1.75% of your loan amount. And that gets added onto your amount finance. So, you know, if I finance $450,000, for example, the monthly MI gets added on top of that, which would now I'm financing, you know, $450,000. $57,000 because I've had to add that upfront mortgage insurance. I've had it, we have a cal calculation down here of what that MI could look like. So if I uh, finance the same 450, my monthly PMI would be 324. Um, and then again, the um, upfront mortgage insurance would be 78, 75. That gets added on top of the loan amount. FHA mortgage insurance cannot be canceled only through a refinance. So ultimately you'd have to refinance into a different product in order to eliminate the mortgage insurance. So you may kind of sit back and, and look at those two different products and say, you know, why would I choose one over the other? And the reason why we might go down one path might be a couple of things. One is what's, what does our credit score look like? And what does our, some of our credit behaviors look like? Um, and then, you know, whether we've had maybe past challenges, maybe a bankruptcy, short sale, foreclosure, there's a little bit more leniency around those items when it comes to an FHA loan versus a conventional loan could be verification of income, or maybe our, what we call our debt to income ratio, which we'll learn about this evening. Uh, the, there's a variety of factors of why we want may want to go down one path or the other. Um, here's the conforming loan limits, as I mentioned, for the greater Sacramento area. So outside of San Joaquin and Sutter, we're going to have the same uh, maximum conforming loan limits. Okay, but then again, if you are going to be, if you're in the other markets like Southern California markets or the Bay Area, um, you know, those are going to be pushing closer to the $970,200 level. Okay, so let's look at some qualifying income. Um, I want to kind of look at the documentation that's generally going to be required and dispel some of the kind of misconceptions when it comes to home buying. Um, we do require to verify the last two years of employment history, um, which it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be on the job two years. You can be on the job one week, as long as we can, we can verify the last two years work history and or education. So if I've, you know, just started a job three months ago in accounting, but I went to school and I got my accounting degree and I served my undergrad, completed that. I would be able to fulfill that two-year work history and or education because I have my undergrad of four years plus my you know one week on the job um, with my accounting firm. So um, that's kind of something that comes up quite a bit in talking with future home buyers is they think they need two years on the job where it's two years of you know education and or work uh, experience. The documentation that we'll generally need from a buyer is going to look like this: It'll usually last two years of W twos last 30 days of pay stubs, and then we'll have to verify the employment in some way, shape, or form. So it's either going to be written or some type of verbal verification. That generally happens once we have an accepted offer uh, for our property. For self-employed individuals, it's a little bit different. We need the last two years of tax returns, uh, some type of profit and loss statement, and then we'll have to verify the business, whether through like a CPA letter, um, website, uh, business license, things of that nature will allow us to verify uh, self-employment income. With self-employment self income, we're gonna verify the last two years. So we're gonna have to show consistency of, of the business for those two years. So that rule of you know having one week in your business and then having you know education behind you, that wouldn't apply. We have to, as a business, show that the business is sustainable and obviously generating profits to um, fulfill your income requirements. Um, if you're working dual employment, so let's say you're in the healthcare industry and you work 30 hours at one clinic, 20 hours at the other, as long as I can show that I've been doing that two years consistently, then that income can be used for qualifying. Uh, and then, you know, if I'm if I'm working W-2, let's say I have a 40-hour workweek job with a W-2 employer, but then I also do Lyft or Uber on the side, we can certainly count that income if there's a profit there, but you do have to show that you're doing it simultaneously two years. So two years driving for Lyft plus doing your W-2 wage employment, 
that would allow you to meet the qualifying. Okay. Any questions on income at all? Uh, I think I saw a question come in. Did I miss a question or no? Okay. All right. I think I, I think we had a hand raised. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me just. Uh, okay. So we had a question come in that said, "Does a letter of intent count as income verification?" Um, I, I think I probably. Um, if you can just kind of expand a little bit more on that question. I'm not sure what a letter of intent, maybe maybe that's an offer letter, offer letter. Okay, if, if that's an offer letter, then offer letter can count as an income verification. So here's what it looks like. We have to know when you're going to, A, it has to be an executed offer letter. Um, and then two is we have to know what your start date is for your job. So the way it works for that, in fact, we have a client that's closing tomorrow on their house. They're getting ready to start their job or they just started their job, but we qualified them on an offer letter. So if, let's say I got an offer letter today. So today is what, June, or sorry, July 26th. And I make an offer on a house. I can use that offer letter to qualify. If I close escrow and on my accepted offer, let's say August 30th, your first mortgage payment is not going to be due until October 1st. So as long as I get my first paycheck on my new job before October 1st, I could use that offer letter for qualifying. So I hope that, hope that answers your question. Um, and then another question came in, what about uh, those who were lost, lost employment during the pandemic, but now back working? So yeah, that, that question comes up often. Um, so that's fine. Um, you know, we will look at your last two years of work history, but let's say, you know, you're working, pandemic hits, you were laid off and now, but you've regained employment. We'll take those current wages for qualifying, assuming you, you know, on a guaranteed hour schedule or, or salary, those can be used for the qualifying. Okay, good questions. All right, and hopefully that the letter of intent question, hopefully I got that covered for you. If not, you know, you can send me a follow-up and I'll answer that on air. Um, okay, let's talk about um, a calculation that we use as lenders that incorporates income, which is called our debt to income ratio calculation. It takes into consideration the gross monthly income versus your outgoing expenses. And generally we don't want that percentage of income to be consumed by obligations for more than 45% of the income, especially for what we call as your housing expense. So just your mortgage should not consume more than 45% of your income. Um, and so that's what we kind of look at as one of our calculations. It doesn't necessarily indicate affordability. It just indicates qualifying. Affordability is a conversation that you and I will have as part of a consultation if you decide to take that next step. Um, the debt to income ratio looks like this. So we're going to take the principal interest, taxes and insurance. So the PITI, it's also referenced down here. So the principal interest, taxes, insurance, PMI if applicable, so private mortgage insurance, HOA or homeowners association dues, that those add up to $2,500 a month, plus my other debts are 500. That means I have 3,000 in expenses. That 3,000 expenses versus my monthly income of $8,500 would put my debt to income ratio at 35.29%. With the hundreds and hundreds of clients that we consult with through first-time buyer programs, and just financing in general, most first-time buyers feel pretty good if their debt to income ratio is around 33 to 36%. Now, I also understand that things are a lot more expensive these days, uh, especially for our clients and buying in you know, higher cost of living markets. So that debt to income ratio may be a little bit higher because housing expenses is, is, is that much uh, uh, more for, for all of us today. Um, so, but I think if you're trying to you know, manage your budget to kind of where we see kind of the optimal level, it's probably around that 33 to 36% level. Okay, so now we've looked a little bit about income, the calculation with debt to income ratio. Now I want to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about assets for qualifying. And we're going to talk more about the documentation of that, that what's needed for you. Um, and, and I will say there's usually kind of two um, obstacles when it comes to home buying. It's usually going to be credit. So we've had some challenges in credit or it's going to be assets because we just don't have enough saved. And we can help kind of navigate those waters of, of both the credit and the asset side of things. So we're gonna we'll look at the assets from, you know, how do we document things? And then we're gonna spend some time looking at like first time home buyer resources for you. Um, so with verifying assets, we're gonna generally need the last two months of statements for you, whether if you're using a checking savings account, 
any type of large deposits will all need to be paper trailed. Um, so you can't deposit cash into your account. That's not acceptable for a real estate transaction. Uh, but re retirement accounts we use, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs. You just wanna to talk to your financial or tax advisor about IRAs because they can, can create a tax consequence. So you wanna make sure that you don't create any disruption there for yourself. And then gift funds can be used. That happens quite a bit for first time buyers. That's where a family member can gift you funds for like your down payment or closing costs for your home purchase. Now there's a paper trail that's required for that, uh, which usually requires a gift letter, the proof of the asset, and then kind of how those funds are being delivered to you. And part of a consultation, we can, if gift funds are, uh, you know, an avenue that you're going to go down for your home buying, we can certainly kind of take you through the proper way of documenting that. Um, now, as I mentioned to you, those two kind of um, challenges for first time home buyers are usually credit or assets. So I want to spend some time kind of talking a little bit about the Cal HFA first time home buyer assistance programs that can help kind of remove that obstacle of savings for your home buying. Uh, Cal HFA stands for the California Housing Finance Agency. And it's designed to help low-income and moderate-income households um, achieve home ownership. And uh, we're proud to be one of the number one partners for Cal HFA. So we get a chance to not only teach these classes on these fantastic products, but also get a chance to deliver to these to clients every day through our work in our community. So um, here's what these assistance programs look like. So there's the My Home and the Zip Assistance Program. Now, these are for the moderate-income households. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what low-income housing looks like and some benefits for that. Um, the My Home program allows a, a buyer to basically borrow up to three or three and a half percent of their down of their sales price for their down payment, but it's a low interest loan at one percent, and they're not required to pay that back until you either sell your home or if you refinance in the future. So it's a really great opportunity. So as you learned earlier, the minimum down payment for a conventional loan is three percent three and a half for FHA. So we can take one of those resources and basically fulfill our entire down payment requirement. Now, when we buy a house, it's not just about down payment, it's also closing costs. And so the zip assistance can also um, help support that um, in it with anywhere between two to 3% of your loan amount for additional assistance. Because of the volatility in the financial markets, this 3% product is not available as much right now because of what we're seeing going around with the interest rates. The 2% is, um, and it's 2% of your loan amount. So if I finance 500,000, I could get $10,000 in closing cost assistance interest-free to help reduce my, my uh, out-of-pocket expense. Now we'll see as the market landscape changes from an interest rate standpoint, hopefully um, the zip assistance will be more available for our clients. Um, there is income limits for these programs. Um, these are the updated moderate income uh, uh, program limits. So as you can see, Sacramento County is $202,000 and that's just for the applicant's income. So if I have, um, if I'm purchasing say jointly with my, with my spouse, uh, but I'm only going to be the only one on the application, we would only look at my income for qualifying. And that holds true for another program, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, which is called the equity builder program. Here's kind of a, a real example of what a $450,000 purchase would look like on the Cal HFA loan. So let's say I bought for 450. My minimum down payment, as we learned, is going to be 13,500 or 3% of my sales price. So I'm going to need to have that 13,500 plus my closing costs, which could be anywhere between nine to 13,500. So that means out of pocket, I'm probably going to need 22 to $27,000, right? Now, if I buy that same house, but then I decide to utilize the Cal HFA conventional loan. Now I can utilize my home assistance to cover my entire down payment amount. So that 13,500. So if I only elect that program, all I would have to worry about is my closing costs anywhere between 19 to $13,000. Um, but if I want to add on maybe the 2% zip program, I could get $8,700 in assistance and now take that total out of pocket to maybe five to $6,000 versus having to come out of pocket with 22 to $27,000. So big, big swing uh, from, you know, having maybe the stretch to purchase versus being able to really make a, a great sustainable purchase for ourselves. So this product can be utilized with conventional loans and FHA loans. The only difference with FHA is we're gonna have that minimum down payment of three and a half percent versus 3%, um, the same application of the My Home and 2% zip assistance.
So here's what that calculation looks like. And again, we're going to send all this presentation material to you first thing tomorrow morning so you can kind of see which product is the best match for you. Um, now, there's been a lot of attention around the next program, which is called the Forgivable Equity Builder Program. In fact, many of you might be joining tonight's class just to learn a little bit more about the Equity Builder Program. Uh, Cal HFA did a lot of promotions, uh, both in the Southern California and in the Northern California markets to launch this program. And it's designed to help low-income housing buyers achieve home ownership. The difference is you can now get up to 10% of your purchase price or appraised value, whichever is less, that can be used towards your down payment and, your, and or your closing costs. And this is an interest-free assistance program and also forgivable. So as long as I maintain residency for the next five years in the house, the assistance of 10% is completely forgiven. So if we, you know, kind of look back at that, now that same $450,000 purchase, instead of me getting 3%, now I would get $45,000 in assistance and I can use that all towards my down payment and just pay the closing costs out of pocket, or I can maybe divvy up some towards down payments, some towards closing costs to reduce my total out of pocket. Now, the big difference is it's designed for low-income housing households. So if you're buying in Sacramento County, the maximum income is $81,920. Um, and that is still is based upon the applicant income. So an example would be is if I make $80,000 a year and my spouse makes $50,000 a year, if we're able to qualify for the home that we're looking for just off my $80,000 in income, then we could potentially use the Forgivable Equity Builder Program because they're only looking at applicant income, not the total household income. And that's that's different than most first-time homebuyer programs. Um, it cannot be combined with the My Home and Zip program. So you're only gonna get the 10%, which is obviously a pretty substantial amount uh, to be able to be used towards the down payment and closing costs. Uh, now, the funds are limited for this program. Um, you know, we get that question often. Um, we're not quite sure what the total runtime looks like, but from my, my conversations with the state, I mean, we're probably looking at enough funds to get us through this year. So it's kind of on a first come, first serve basis. Um, now, we can't register first time buyers for the program until they have an actual accepted, whoops, accepted offer for a property. So you would actually have an agreement with the seller before we can actually register and lock in your interest rate with the state. Here's the eligibility requirements for the down payment assistance program. So it's a minimum 640 credit score for FHA, uh, 680 for a conventional loan if you're using the moderate income product. For the low income housing, it's 660. Um, and then we kind of talked a little bit more about it's only based upon applicant income. Uh, and a first time home buyer is someone that hasn't owned in the last three years. Okay, so that gets a little confused too. So what that means is that if I have not owned a home, in the last three years, maybe let's say I sold a house in 2017, but I've been renting since then for the last five years, I would still be considered a first-time home buyer. Um, and it can be used for a variety of different programs, or sorry, for properties. It just has to be one unit property. So single family homes, condos, townhouses, manufactured homes, uh, below market homes. If, in case you don't know what below market means, it's basically uh, there's designated properties that builders have designated to low-income housing families, and they're called below market homes. Um, they are also eligible with the Cal HFA assistance programs. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about some of those BMR homes, you can kind of look at uh, SHRA, which is Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency site. They have a list of what's out there in terms of BR, BMR homes. Um, and there's also listings in, in the Bay Area as well, too, if you're joining us from, from Bay Area or even South, Southern California markets. Um, manufactured homes are eligible um, the one kind of really important point here is it cannot be on land that is, um, sorry, it can be on in a leased space, meaning it can't be a manufactured home that's in like a mobile home park, for example. It has to be actually on land that's owned. Okay, any questions on the Cal HFA assistance program that I can help answer? Try to take some time out here to make sure that we get any questions answered. Okay. If something comes up and you know you do have something that, that you want to kind of share with the group, please please reach out. We'll uh, make make sure we kind of circle back to any of those topics we've gone through. Um, I want to transition now into the six steps of home buying. So this is the home buying process, which I think is a really helpful kind of visual aid to take you through what does it look like to be pre-approved for your home, all the way to step six to get you know, the keys to your house. So we have many clients that are going through this process as we speak, um, and uh, all of them are at different kind of milestones. But the first place we start is pre-approval. 
And what pre-approval is, is that's basically us certifying that your lending is in place and it's the output of a consultation. Um, and you provide the certificate that we give you to a potential seller of a home and it shows the seller that you've been all qualified for your mortgage, income, credit, assets, maybe the assistance program that's all been validated for you. A pre-approval is good for 60 days, but we can always extend it or recertify it down the line if you need to take a little bit longer. So there's no hurry to go through home shopping. Um, we have had some clients been shopping for two years, two months, sometimes two weeks, but we can cert recertify it if we need to. There's a difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification. Many lenders, especially a lot of our online lenders will do pre-qualifications. All a pre-qualification does is it just checks your credit, the income that you put into the application and then send you a pre-qualification. In this market, while it's still, it's changing and evolving a bit, pre-approvals are the only thing that's really gonna be uh, supported by a seller in the marketplace. So that's the only thing we do. We don't do pre-qualifications, we only do pre-approvals. Um, so pre-approval is the first stop in our journey towards homeownership. The second is gonna be house hunting. That's the fun part. You generally will be partnering with the realtor. As we mentioned, realtors are paid for by the seller. So we always encourage taking advantage of that resource. We have a fantastic network of preferred realtors all across California. So if you're looking in a particular market, we can get you connected with someone that can help in that home search. Um, most of your home searches will begin online. And then once you've identified a few properties that you think maybe fit the characteristics that you're looking for, you would go out and kind of physically tour those properties. Now, let's say we go out and find a property and we're really interested in it. And we're asking our realtor to write an offer on that property. Um, they would do that, put, build that whole offer together. You would have to docu-sign usually that. Um, and then that offer gets presented to the seller. Now, if that seller comes back and says, yeah, guess what? I, I will accept that offer. That's going to move us to step three, which is called entering escrow. And that means the seller said, yes, we're going to move forward. We've accepted the terms of your offer. And now we've started the escrow time period. Usually from acceptance of offer to when I get the keys to my house, it takes about 30 days. So that's kind of the expectations It's about 30 days. Um, within two to three days of the acceptance of offer, you as a buyer will be required to make an earnest money deposit. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in just a bit, but ultimately it's one to 2% of your purchase price. If you're joining us from the Bay Area, it's probably going to be closer to 3%. Uh, a question that comes up often is, does my assistance cover that deposit? The answer is no. You'd actually have to come out of pocket with that initial funds. At the same time, those funds that you're putting out of pocket will count towards your total out-of-pocket expense, the closing costs, maybe the down payment, or a combination of both. But that's called an earnest money deposit. Um, within 24 hours of your accepted offer, you'll begin a call from our team to set up your follow-up consultation. So we meet with all of our clients again, once we have an accepted offer to go over the terms and conditions of the loan, make sure they feel good about the interest rate, their out-of-pocket expense, talk about some of the milestones that we're going to um, go through as we begin this journey. Uh, we'll also have an appraisal ordered on your property and your realtor will generally order inspections for your house. Um, and then finally, to wrap up step three, we'll be sending initial disclosures to you that highlights all the features of your, your uh, financing. Um, this is a slide that talks to the earnest money deposit. Again, it's going to be anywhere between one to 2% of your purchase price can go as high as 3%. Now, your deposit money that you make on a home is going to be protected by what we call the contingency period. And what a contingency does, it allows you to do your due diligence on the property. It's usually anywhere from between 10 to 17 days to go out and do your homework on the property, which includes getting your house appraised, which is something that we would go ahead and handle as your lender. Uh, your realtor would orchestrate inspections. So home inspection, pool, roof, sewer, whatever you think you need to do to make sure you feel comfortable with the, with the property. And then finally, we wanna get your loan approved. All that's gonna happen in anywhere between 10 to 17 days. And like I said, your, while you have that contingency in place, your deposit is completely protected. Now, we're gonna continue down this path and we're gonna go to step four, which is now processing and underwriting. That's where we do all the administrative work on your loan. We verify your employment, your assets. Um, we may have some additional documentation that we need to get from you. Your interest rate is probably locked in by that time. Um, and so you'll be signing your disclosures that you receive. And then at step four, we're preparing to send everything to our underwriting team who is going to underwrite your loan and issue your loan approval. That also brings us to the end of your contingency period. So now we have our appraisal loan and our inspection contingencies due. As long as we feel comfortable with the property, we'll want to let our realtor know that we're okay to sign off on the contingencies. 
Um, if for some reason we're having second thoughts, we could potentially cancel and get a full refund of our deposit. But if we sign off on the contingencies and then three days later, we decide that's not a good fit for us. If you decide to cancel after the contingency removal, then you could potentially risk your deposit. So you wanna be careful with taking that step before you know being totally comfortable with the property. Um, at step five, we're also gonna issue to you a final closing disclosure. Whoops. And that's gonna give you a three day cooling off period before you move to the very final stage, which is step six or closing the loan. And that's where we're basically at the finish line. You're gonna be signing final documents in person with the public notary. Uh, there will be a final amount of money due at that time. Uh, whatever that dollar amount is, you'll be making that final deposit into escrow. On the lending side, we'll go ahead and deposit in your first mortgage as well as assistance programs if you've elected that. And then there's an, what we call an escrow team that will, will basically balance all the financing and make sure that you've contributed what you're supposed to as a buyer and the seller's receiving their appropriate net proceeds. Once that's all taken place, then they'll record documents with the local county recorder's office. They generally record a grant deed, which transfers ownership to you, and then they record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. And so once they get confirmation of that recording, then you would become the official owner of the, owner of the property. Okay, And then you get a chance to high five, you get a chance to tell all your friends and coworkers, family, what the huge accomplishment you had. So um, that's kind of what the journey, journey looks like in home ownership. Again, that's our six steps of home buying. Um, now, as I mentioned, before we get that pre-approval issued, we start with a consultation. That's a 20 to 30 minute video and or phone session with myself or one of our team members to design what we call a home buying plan for you. Um, that home buying plan, you know, looks at your budget, uh, looks at your resources for down payment, assistance program eligibility, all that stuff to be able to kind of kind of encapsulate that into a pre-approval. So if you want to start moving towards step uh, step two, that you know you're fully prepared uh, with your financing. Um, that consultation uh, involves completing an online application, uploading proof of income and assets, and then kind of scheduling that consultation time. And we out have all of those links here on this slide. Um, now, if you have some follow-up questions after today's session and you just want to maybe go, may go through some questions with us and maybe kind of go through maybe the assistance program or your income situation, we can do an intro call. You can schedule that at any time using those links as well. Here's kind of the framework of the consultation. Um, so this is what that'll look like. Application, interest rate, talking about where we're gonna buy, because obviously that'll change our sales price. Uh, we'll go through the six steps of home buying. And then, like I said, issue that pre-approval um, after we're wrapped up, okay? Um, okay, we had a question come in. So let me just see if I can go through this question, then we'll move on to our next topic. Uh -huh. So let me just, I'll read this question on here and we can kind of tackle this as a group here. So if I'm a student right now with a low income, but I have confirmed employment for June, 2023, that puts me over the income level for Cal HFA. By when do I need to buy a house in order to qualify for low income Cal HFA benefits? So the way it works is if, if you're gonna start utilize that income for qualifying um, and it's not till next year, um, it would be subjected to today's income limits. Um, so you have to be within the income limits and, and purchase your house at this time based upon your current income. Now, that being said, every year, right around July, the income limits get updated with Cal HFA. So we just had a, a recent update. We went from 78,000 to what we have now, which is with the 81,000 level. So those things will be adjusted throughout the year. So it may be something if you do have a planned income increase in June of 2023, hopefully next month, um, with the income changes, you'll be within the program limits. Okay, good question. Um, okay, so that's our that's our free personal consultation. Just a couple of the resources I want to share with you. So this is our mobile app. You can start the application process there. You can also um, calculate different payment options uh, through the mobile app. That's a really great tool to be able to use. It's good, good for Android, Apple, so you can download it for all those different uh, platforms. Um, we, As I mentioned earlier, we have community partnerships. Um, so for state employees, we have a discount program, and we have a variety of different um, alumni discounts that are available too, and a lot of them um, impactful for our local Sacramento community. So we actually just launched launched, uh, or actually we're launching a discount program with Sacramento State. We're going to have one of our first Sacramento State uh, workshops coming up in the next 60 days. So if you're alum with Sac State, or if you have friends or family, maybe colleagues that um, went to Sac State, 
please tell them about our upcoming events there with Sac State and the discount program. And then for all the other universities like UC Davis and UCI and Long Beach that you see listed, uh, there's, a, there's the same discount program available. And you get access, obviously, to all of our consultations and our different home buying plans that we put together. Um, so really great partnerships that we're really proud of. And we have more that we'll probably be announcing soon. So be on the lookout for those. Um, our workshops are... Um, our free services that we provided to our communities just to inform them and educate everyone on home ownership. Um, if you think you have uh, friends or family that, that would benefit from this, please have them check out mortgageeducate.com. That lists all of our upcoming classes that we'll be doing. So we're gonna be, we have one that we're gonna do next uh, next month for our Long Beach alumni, but anybody's welcome to join any one of those classes. So please feel free to check those out. Um, you know, again, we, we understand that this is, you know, kind of a big deal of taking time out to learn about home ownership. It's probably gonna be, one of your largest investments you make in your lifetime. So, you know, thanks again for, you know, taking that time to be able to learn a little bit more about how this journey towards homeownership could look look like for you. So um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep us online for just a few more minutes to see if we have any wrap up questions. Um, and, uh, and we can, um, Kind of sign off for the night in just a little bit. I, you know, before I before I end the presentation too, I want to let you know. Check out some of our um, our, our social channels too. I mean, follow us on Instagram or, or Facebook. I mean, check out kind of what we're doing. We love to kind of share updates on financial news in our industry, but also celebrate some of the experiences that our clients have had with us. A lot of which are graduates from our classes that we've taught over the last what six years. Um, and we have, I think, some pretty fun, phenomenal rule uh, reviews on both our Google and our our Yelp. Account. So please check those out when you have time. Um, we've also included the button here for scheduling appointments. So if you do want to schedule that intro call or consultation, you can do that right there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to leave us live for a little bit longer and then and then we'll sign off for tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and mute out for right now, but I'll look for the any questions that come through our Q&A and then we'll uh, sign off. Okay, it looks like we're we're good on our questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign us off tonight. Again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's uh, home buyer workshop. And, you know, if we can connect with you in the future, please reach out to us. We'd love to be able to meet up with you for either consultation or intro call. Make sure you get all those questions answered for you and your home ownership journey. Have a great evening. We'll talk to y'all soon.